How much do you know about Antarctica? Welcome to the Everything Antarctica podcast, where your hosts, Maddie Jordan and Johnny Harrison, will answer all of your questions. We'll talk to globally recognised experts, discuss current affairs, news, and ultimately highlight why Antarctica should matter to you. Come on a journey as we unpack everything you've ever wondered about the world's most extreme environment. Hello and welcome to the Everything Antarctica podcast. I'm your host, Maddie Jordan, and once again, I'm joined by my co-host, Johnny Harrison. How's it going, Johnny? Good, Maddie. What are we talking about today? Today, we are having a go at answering some listener questions. And I say listener questions, but they're actually questions that came through from people that I polled on Instagram. There's all the stuff that people want to know about what's going on in Antarctica at the moment. So, What's top of the list? Well, we've had hundreds. We've had hundreds of questions that come in, but there was one that I knew was going to come up because it keeps coming up every single time I ask this question, and that was, how did you get a job in Antarctica? So, Johnny, do you want to tell us how you got a job in Antarctica? Sure thing. So, uh, for me, I, um, I'm an electrician, so I uh, kept an eye on the website, and um, Antarctica New Zealand have a, a recruiting pool that goes throughout every year. And um, yeah, so when that when that opened up, I applied, put my application in with my CV as as per applying for any job, and uh, yeah, came for an interview, and then kind of went from there. Really. So, what about you? Uh, it really is as simple as that. You know, I saw a, a job advertised on LinkedIn. Uh, I followed all of the national Antarctic programs on LinkedIn, and. Yeah, it popped up. There was a project management role that was advertised for Antarctica New Zealand. I was actually living in Australia at that point in time. So uh, I'd, I knew if I did get the job that it was going to be a bit of a move for me. But the um, the desire to work in Antarctica was better than the desire to stay in Australia. So I saw the job ad and I got a bit ambitious. I called the recruiter straight away and said, look, this is the job for me. Uh, you don't need to take any more applications. As soon as you get mine, that's pretty much going to be it. You're going to decide that I'm getting the job and um, that's going to be that. And I think he um, he went, oh, this is interesting. We'll see what happens when his CV comes through and see if he actually does meet all the qualifications and requirements. And I was lucky enough that I did. Uh, I don't know whether he had a hand in pushing my application through to the folks that actually looked at it, but... Um, yeah, it generally was just an application online from a, a job advert that I'd seen on LinkedIn. So um, that's probably the easiest way to go about finding a job. What do you think? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, th- I think there's also um, a lot of the big Antarctic institutes, they'll they'll obviously have their own recruiting for base staff or, or you know, their station staff or even uh, field camp support and other bits and pieces, those kind of roles. But then um, one of the other ways is to get down with um, through like a, a science university or or um, other kind of science body and um, as, as a scientist or, or, or support of, of um, scientific research. So, so mm. Yeah, lots of different ways to get down there, I think. Um, but for us, yeah, it was a pretty standard process. Just saw a job ad and applied. Uh, had the skills and the qualifications to get there and and that was it hooked for life pretty much uh cool the next question that we've got is definitely one for you johnny because you are the one who is qualified to talk on this and i'm not but how do we produce power in antarctica (laughs) good question um so uh a lot of the stations will have different ways of doing it but um at uh, scott base in mcmurdo we we have a little uh microgrid um, a power grid that joins the two together and so depending on uh, who needs more power power either is exported or imported to, the, to either side um, at Scott Base there's three uh, smaller diesel generators that run and they're accompanied by a, um, a three turbine wind farm at the moment so I think there's plans afoot to replace that with a with a bigger four turbine uh, set soon so it's pretty exciting but um, typically speaking diesel is a uh, reasonably um, a reasonably good source of energy being how how much energy you get out of such a condensed fuel um, so a lot of stations will run uh, diesel generators as their kind of main backups and then they'll have supplementary power over and above that 
Cool. And you talk about a, a shared grid between Scott Bass and McMurdo. So how does that work? Yeah, that one's a bit of a, a quirky one because, of course, um, New Zealand's frequency is, is 50 hertz and then uh, America's is uh, 60 hertz. So, and their, their voltage that they operate out of the wall socket's 110 volts, whereas theirs is 220. So there's a, f- a few little fun things there. So we um, we we join onto their um, grid basically at their grid voltage and um, we have a, a frequency converter based at Scott Bass, which does all of the um, in, importing and exporting and making sure that it's all converted correctly so that um, we're all safe as houses. Oh, and that would be a pretty unique situation in Antarctica with a, a shared grid and say most of the other bases would be pretty well standalone and generate their own power? Yeah, exactly right. So most of them, it's um, as you say, it's very uncommon uh, for, for particularly different voltages to be shared but um, particularly even frequencies it's, um, yes, we're, we're in, due to our proximity to, to the American base, that's the only real reason why it's got real merit. Cool. Uh, well, that um, that leads us really nicely onto our next question. Uh, a lot of people had seen videos and photos and things that I've put up from Scott Bass and uh, I've made mention a couple of times of going over to McMurdo. Um, so the question that's come through is how much do you get to interact with other bases? <laughs> yeah, I guess that is one thing that um, uh, Scott Bass is, is very lucky to have have a neighbour in, in McMurdo, and um, that distance is about three k's, so about two miles away. So, um, and that's that's uh, accessed by by a gravel road. So, um, you can the the Americans do a great job of of grading that that road year round. So, it's um, typically it's it's pretty pretty well always ready to go. So you can either go by foot if the conditions allow, or or vehicles. There's plenty of modes of transportation. So no doubt which we'll touch on in future episodes. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've ridden a bike across there. Uh, it's a bit brutal getting up that first hill, but um, yeah, there's plenty of ways to get there. Um, often throughout the season, if we've got some good sea ice, you can actually access McMurdo from the sea ice as well, going around the other way, which um, opens up opportunities like cross-country skiing and things like that to get around as well. So It also shows your Strava as you're being in the middle of the ocean. When <laughs> it does, yeah. The GPS location, they don't typically associate sea ice with, um, with land. They associate sea ice with being ocean, which makes sense because that's what it is. But yeah, looking at a at a GPS map of a route that you've just walked, it often looks like you've been walking on water, so that's pretty cool. Cool. Our next question has come in from Tim, and he's asked, you're away for a really long period of time. How do you cope being away from family and friends? Yeah, that's a good question. And it is, to be fair, it's probably one of the hardest things that people have to deal with. Um, one of the nice things is having having comms back with home and, and you know, you think 60 years ago when they had to do it via a radio telephone, um, it was pretty, you know, <laughs> everyone could hear the conversation and, and it was one person at a time, whereas now we're pretty lucky, you know, and, and I think um, trialling newer technology nowadays and you can essentially have a, a reasonable level of, of the same kind of level of communications that you'd expect to have at home um, right at your fingertips, which is absolute game changer. But, um, yeah, it, it does take it out of you. Um, and it's not just, it's not so much the not seeing people, um, but it's also that kind of uh, wanting to be there during life events, big life events and things like that, that you just can't um, can't get back for. Those, those are the hard moments, right? Definitely, yeah. I missed a couple of weddings while I was down south for the winter and, um, yeah, was away for some things like Easter and my partner's birthday and managed to just sneak home for my own birthday but it's those sorts of things that um, it just comes with the territory and they're the kinds of things that you just have to accept right there's some sacrifices that need to be made absolutely I mean nothing good comes without a bit of sacrifice I reckon so definitely mm. yeah um, while we're on that so we, we spoke a little bit about um, communications back in the day obviously when these research stations were getting set up the means of communication was via HF radio, um, which was obviously not that reliable. And going back even further to the early explorers, they had to often wait years before they got a letter from home to find out what's going on, just a very brief update. But now, particularly this season, um, a lot of stations are starting to introduce Starlink and other types of high-speed satellite internet, which really does open up a whole world of communication opportunities. We had the opportunity to uh, essentially video call from our phones to loved ones and things like that. So that definitely made the distance feel not quite as great, which is pretty cool. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think when I was wintering there, we had a two megabit connection that we all had to share. <laughs> so it kind of uh, there wasn't quite video comms at that point, but um, we had um, limited uh, video f- uh, conferencing facilities, which were definitely useful and and made a big difference for sure. But yeah, you think uh, yeah you go back years and, and you think you got to wait years before you can even see a see a letter come from home or or, or send that correspondence. It's um, it's a long wait from both sides. That's for sure. Yeah, I um, I look at some of the other folks that I've spent some time down south with and many of them have young families and kids and things back home but the opportunity has popped up that for them is once in a lifetime. They'll go away for either a summer for six months or so or a winter which will be sort of can be over a year and yeah, having a chat to them after they get back, you know, their kids have grown and they look different and they've started new hobbies and gone off and done other things and I can't imagine how hard that must be for parents and things to be leaving kids and um, yeah, other loved ones behind. It must be pretty challenging. Yeah, absolutely. I think the other side of this whole coin as well is that um, it actually the the impact of communications or having communications at your fingertips um, changes base dynamics considerably from what it once was, where um, that sort of team environment and kind of you being there with with these people that you're you're living with, um, you sort of by by bringing this element of of home and while it's great in a, a lot of areas, it's also there's kind of that that uh, catch twenty two of of potentially maybe distri- um you know kind of breaking up some of that uh, team culture in some ways um, at times. Definitely. That's pretty much all the questions that we've got at the moment. I mean, there's plenty more that we will get through in the future, but uh, those are the ones that immediately came through. So I I like this episode format. Yeah, it's some uh, different, eh? But bit easier. Yeah, I think a little bit less research for us when they come in. Um, we can just sort of talk about what our experiences were and um, and the things that we know about. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, let us know what you thought about the uh, format and the, the style of this one. And if you've got any other questions or anything like that, feel free to flick them through. We're always keen for, for more ideas and exploring more and more. So Definitely. Yeah. And guest episodes. So we've got one of those coming up. Uh, it's going to be pretty special. We won't tell you who's coming on just yet. But um, yeah, that'll be a new format for us to explore and it'd be nice to have someone else in the studio that we can we can talk to about their area of expertise. You save you just looking at us too the whole time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have to get another camera, Johnny. <laughs> um, cool. Thanks very much for listening. Uh, don't forget, if you've learnt anything at all in this episode, please subscribe, rate and review the podcast so we can get the message out to more people. Uh, that's what it's all about, trying to educate folks and tell them more about Antarctica. So please don't forget to do that and reach out on social media if there's anything else that you want us to talk about. That's it for today's episode of the Everything Antarctica podcast. Thanks for listening. If you want to find out more about us as hosts, you can find us on Instagram at Maddie K. Jordan and at Johnny Harrison NZ. We're also on socials. You can find us at Everything Antarctica. This episode will be released on all streaming platforms and the long form video will be found on YouTube. Check us out wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave us a five-star rating. This will really help us in our mission to make this podcast as good as it possibly can be. Please share this episode with your friends and social networks so we can spread the word to more people. Until next time, stay cool.